This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and like always if you're enjoying what we're doing on the podcast, please consider subscribing and leaving us a review and that means we can bring you more and more great content. Speaking of great content, we've got a wonderful interview today. We're going to be speaking to Michael Molkentine. Michael is the author of a new book called Anzac and Aviator about the famous flight from England to Australia in 1919. And he joins us today on the phone to talk about it. Michael, thanks for coming on Living History. G'day, Matt. Thanks. Good to be with you. Mate, it was, I can't believe it, but it was 12 years ago that we first met and worked together on Lost in Flanders, the documentary we made about the discovery of the Australian bodies in Belgium. Why don't you tell everyone, bring us up to speed. It's been a hell of a journey you've been on from that time until now. Just give us an update on everything you've been doing in the history space because it's really quite extraordinary. Oh, um, well, yeah, 12 years ago, um, I was a a young graduate teacher. Uh, I think I was in my my second or third year of teaching and I hadn't written any books yet, but I I certainly was interested in pursuing um, a career in history and... Yeah, so after making the the documentary film with you, which was a, a really wonderful experience, you know, involved some of my first uh, trips to overseas battlefields, um, I wrote a book called Fire in the Sky, uh, which was a, a history of the Australian Flying Corps in the First World War. And um, after that, I went on to do a PhD thesis at the University of New South Wales, which was actually part of a project the Australian Army was sponsoring to produce a... Uh, five-volume history of Australia in the First World War for the centenary, um, edited by the late uh, Jeff Gray. And I produced a volume uh, on Australia in the War in the Air, and it was quite different to my book, uh, Fire in the Sky. Um, Fire in the Sky was very much about the individual experience of pilots and um, and ground crew in the uh, in the Australian Flying Corps during the First World War, um, whereas my thesis was more of an operational and strategic and even political level history of uh, Australia's involvement in the air in the in the First World War. Um, during my time as a, a PhD candidate, I also somehow managed to squeeze in a, a short book for the National Library on Charles Ulm and Charles Kingsford Smith's Trans-Pacific Flight. Uh, and, um, yeah, I've spent the last few years uh, working on um, this new book about Ross Smith and the, the 1919 England to Australia air race. It's been absolutely extraordinary to watch your career blossom, mate, because I was there standing beside you the first time you walked onto the battlefields of the Western Front, and I remember you were so excited. You took a photo of a shrapnel ball that you found on the ground, and anyone who's been to the Western Front will know that you find those littered all over the place, and it was just great because you were so excited to be walking the ground that you'd read so much about. How have you made this transition now into really one of Australia's foremost experts on the air war, which was something that we didn't really discuss too much in those early days when we were first walking the battle? Yeah, well, I think uh, when I was at at Wollongong University doing my undergraduate degree, um, I became aware that um, although, you know, a lot had been written about the First World War and about particularly Australia's experience in the First World War, there were some uh, some aspects of it that were very much um, under, uh, had been underexplored. And I suppose I was also surprised to find out that when we looked at the air, the war in the air, there were there was an incredibly rich documentary record um, both here in Australia at the Australian War Memorial and in the various state libraries, but certainly as well overseas in a number of British and American archives as well. And I just felt, I mean, I'd always been interested in aviation and in and in the war in the air, but um, I felt that that archive had really been underutilised and I just thought there were some, some fantastic stories to be told from that archive and also that it could, could add much to our, to our understanding of the conflict more broadly and, and the nation's history more broadly. Why do you think it is, Michael, that we've overlooked the air war for so long and focused just on infantry operations during the First World War? Uh, well, look, I think the the air war, in some ways, it hasn't been overlooked. I mean, in popular culture, it's 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 been very popular uh, to, you know, I mean, films, particularly during the 1920s and 30s. But, you know, since then, um, you know, a number of films have been made about it, um, books, fiction and nonfiction have been written. But I suppose it hasn't really been looked at um in in an academic or in a by professional historians um, quite so much until until more recently there's been certainly some good work done in the last couple of decades um, from the Australian perspective I think it, 
could have something to do with the fact that um, the Australian contribution was pretty small, really, compared to... Uh, to, to the whole and where Australians were flying in the British flying services, they tended not to fly um, wearing Australian uniforms or in distinctly Australian um, uniforms. And so they, they, they kind of got, I suppose, absorbed into, into the British effort, much like um, a, a, a number of Australian airmen did in the Second World War with the Empire Air Training Scheme. We should move on to the new book about Sir Ross Smith, which I think is an absolutely fascinating topic. But before we get into the, the, the meat of that book, he was pretty typical of the airmen of the First World War, wasn't he? Because he landed at Gallipoli, he fought in the infantry, but then went on to join the Flying Corps. Was, was that a typical route that airmen took during the First World War from the infantry or the light horse, I believe he was in, to uh, eventually becoming pilots and observers in the in the uh, Flying Corps? Yeah, exactly. He, he was very typical. Um, the, the Australian Flying Corps only, only w- was, was um, raised at the start of the war. I mean, when war broke out, the, the flying school at um, Point Cook that the government had built, um, which was effectively uh, three or four biplanes and a collection of tents, um, it was still a couple of weeks away from being open. So there was no Australian air arm to speak of when the war began in 1914. So even young men who did want to fly uh, really didn't have any option to, except for a very, very select few, or those who had gone overseas to Britain before the war. And, and Ross Smith was one of those, although we don't, he, as far as we know, he didn't express any desire to be a pilot before the war. Uh, he enlisted in the Light Horse, um, and he did so because he, he really, Really had a great love of horses. He'd grown up on the land, um, and he joined the light horse. He went off and trained in Egypt um, as part of the first contingent. Went to Gallipoli. Was quite fortunate to survive um, his experiences at Gallipoli. There are a number of of uh, very narrow escapes that he had during that time, and he lost a number of uh, friends and comrades that he talks about in his letters. Um, and then, yeah, it was in 1916 in the Sinai Desert when the Australian Flying Corps' number one squadron happened to be looking for volunteers to fill its to fill its ranks. And in particular, they were looking for light horsemen who had a knowledge of both the terrain that the squadron was operating over in the Sinai Desert, but also understood light horse tactics because the, air, the airmen were quite regularly cooperating with light horse units on the ground. Isn't it extraordinary, this early era of flying? It's, you know, it's only a decade or so after man first took to the air. And now there's still that connection. The, the, the term is often used, the knights of the air. And there's still this connection. I love it between horsemen and getting in these flimsy aircraft and going up. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. There's a, real, there's a real aura of chivalry around this time, isn't there? Yeah, there is, Matt. And I've got to say, um, I was very sceptical and dubious about that whole concept in that I felt it was probably something that had been manufactured or constructed after the war in Hollywood films and in some of the literature that was written by, um, well, sometimes by pilots themselves, but more often than not by others. But I've got to say, in um, reading Ross Smith's letters to his mother, which was one of my major sources for this book, he actually engages with some of that mythology and he actually likens aerial combat uh, to, um, to... the kind of combat that knights would have fought um, on horseback. Um, and he also does um, extend chivalrous attitudes towards his enemies, to the German airmen, which I found quite extraordinary because he absolutely hated the Germans. Um, and he expressed on a number of occasions uh, joy at killing um, Germans because um, because he hated them. He hated them because he'd read about um, the atrocities they'd committed early in the war in the newspapers. Um, he was incensed by German U-boats sinking British ships and American ships with civilians on them. And his own brother was killed at Passchendaele. And so he, he really was out for revenge for that. But despite that, he engaged in some of that... Um, I suppose we could say um, fraternisation or friendly behaviour towards German airmen um, during the, the campaign in Palestine. He engaged in dropping packages uh, for men who'd been shot down and, um, and, and, and being open to the Germans reciprocating that. At the same time, though, it's really interesting that that doesn't seem to have tempered him um, in combat and he was quite ruthless in aerial combat. And um, on a number of occasions, Ross Smith 
1917 and 18 would force uh, an adversary down. The German pilot would make a, a forced landing and then he would proceed to strafe them and, and, and sometimes kill the man where he stood on the ground. So um, it's, it's this interesting tension, I think, between what um, men like Ross Smith, airmen like Ross Smith, um, hoped the war would be like, what they wanted it to be like, and the reality of what it, it needed to be like, really, for them to survive and to do their job. Ross Smith is not a particularly well-known Australian in, in any sort of field. I didn't really know too much about him until I spent some time in Adelaide. And then every time I'd fly into Adelaide, I'd, I'd see the little hangar that contained his plane that he used in this great epic journey that we're going to talk about shortly. What led you to want to tell the story of Ross Smith and this amazing aerial journey in 1919? Yeah, so I came across, I came across him when I was writing my first book, um, fire in the sky on the Australian Flying Corps. He was um, probably the, he was certainly the most successful Australian airman in, in the Middle East um, in number one squadron. And he was one of the most highly decorated Australian airmen in the First World War. Um, for one thing, he was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross three times. And there were only three uh, British airmen um, in the whole war who who were, were awarded that, um, that medal three times. So um, he stands out just for his just for his wartime activities but then of course as you mentioned there's the extraordinary journey that he makes um after the war when um when he flies an aircraft from england to australia as part of a a competition that the government had announced um in 1919 and so i knew that there was potential there for um a great um and in some ways unsung um australian aviator to have a story told about him i knew that um the only biography that had been written about him was a double biography um that was published 50 years ago and has been out of sin uh, out of print ever since um but what really was the thing that decided it for me, Matt, was um, during my PhD research, I came across his private papers in the State Library in South Australia. And I've got to say, I've looked at over the years, uh, I would say now hundreds of collections of private papers at the Australian War Memorial, um, overseas at the Royal Air Force Museum, um, at archi in archives in North America. And the Ross Smith papers would have to be, I would say, one of the most uh, one of the richest um, collections, private collections of papers that exist for any Australian um, man who fought in the First World War. And I, I, when I saw those, I just thought, look, not only is there a great story there to tell, but here through these rich, revealing, candid um, personal records, there's the means to tell it in a way that will be, um, I think, thorough and hopefully insightful. Well, tell us about the book because I've read it. It's really, um, it's really quite engaging. I, I didn't realise the, the story of Ross Smith and his brother Keith. It's, it's absolutely quite extraordinary. Give us an overview of what you cover. Yeah, so I approach the book um, very much in the, I suppose, in the sense of a traditional narrative biography in that the book begins with, with Ross's birth um, and it ends 29 years later um, when, when he's tragically killed. Um, and the, the book really um, begins the first set. Essentially, I've divided the book into four sections. Um, first section of the book deals with Ross's childhood, um, which was spent... Um, uh, on the land, his father managed a sheep station in South Australia, one of the largest sheep stations in South Australia. Um, but also he did spend his teenage years in um, in Adelaide where he, he came to go to boarding school. Um, quite remarkably, and, and, and one of my favourite things that I discovered um, when writing the book was that he, he joined the Mounted Cadets as a, as a 17 or 18-year-old and um, was in, involved in a round-the-world tour um, in 1911 to um, essentially see how armies and cadet movements and armaments factories overseas worked and he and his mates traveled all around the world and it was really quite an extraordinary thing in those days and that's actually where he first saw um, airplanes flying in in britain at that time because that's something we often forget about the first world war isn't it that it was a totally different era and there was a much stronger connection between civilians and the military than than we could possibly comprehend today and when you see service records that often men wrote down that they'd been part of a cadet unit or a, or a militia unit. And so it, it, as, as extraordinary as that world tour sounds, it, it wasn't unusual for men to have, and boys, to have quite a connection to the military before they enlisted, was it? During um, the war, at one point, Ross writes to his mother and, and basically says to her, it's early in the war, and says, you know, there was never any question of me enlisting straight away. And he said, I'd always knew that if there was a war, that if Britain needed 
help that I would I would enlist. And when you look at the, when you read the first section of uh, of my book, I think I think I've shown that really clearly that when when we look at Ross Smith's childhood and indeed probably the childhoods of many many of his peers, we see that there is just absolutely no way that when war started they weren't going to be involved in it. And I, and I think there's three kind of pillars in his childhood as I describe them that make that the case and the first one and they all come through his education as well as his involvement in the cadets and then more broadly just his involvement in civic life in an Australian city in um, the early years of the 20th century first one of those is is empire nationalism so Ross Smith is raised to see himself um, as an Australian but as as a British Australian, and he really sees no tension between those two identities, and 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 any fight that's Britain's fight is 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 very much his fight. There's no conflict of interest there in his mind. Um, the second thing is is militarism, um, and he's raised, as you say, in a, in a society that venerates military service, that sees service in the military um, as a civic duty, not maybe as we see it today so much as a, as a career, but as a civic duty. And I think that's reflected in his his time in the cadets. And the third pillar of his childhood that I think contributes to this, and, and this might sound strange to, uh, to people in, in our day and age, but it is the Victorian or the, the, the Victor, late Victorian and the Edwardian um, preoccupation with sport or what they called games and and ross was very very keen sportsman by all accounts he was very good at it and um sport was seen in those days as not only something that bred uh, that developed physical fitness but something that also developed um moral fitness and character and as an extension of that ross saw um competing with each other, whether it be on the sporting field or on the battlefield, as something that men did and something that nations did. And essentially, there's almost this sort of Darwinian um, notion in in his thinking that um, it's just war, just as sport, is part of the natural order of things and that men compete and that the strongest are the ones who prevail. It's fascinating that you say that, Michael, because I've often said this in my time studying history, that the especially during the First World War, the incredible link that exists between sport and war. And you see it at so many levels. You see the famous poster, Join the Sportsman's 1000. You see the the captain of the football team being immediately made an officer as soon as he joined. There just just seemed to be this overwhelming desire. And as you say, it's hard for us to understand it at this remove of a century down the track. But there just seemed this overwhelming desire that war was the ultimate sport. It was the ultimate way to test your mettle on the ultimate sporting field because the consequences of not succeeding were death. And it just seemed that it, it was a factor that just drove men forward to enlist, to fight, to keep fighting when they would otherwise have given up. It's absolutely extraordinary. It is, yeah. And and one of the one of the things that I find fascinating is the way that in his accounts of combat, um, Ross, both both on in the trenches at, at Gallipoli and in the Sinai on his um on uh, on horseback, but also especially in aerial combat, Ross often employs in his descriptions of combat metaphors about sport Um, and he often describes aerial combat as being a a competition or a game and the enemy as being his adversary or his opponent and I think that's evidence of that that kind of that that um, that overlap between sport and uh, and war in that in the in the world view of those men. So the first part of the book deals with his uh, that that fascinating upbringing, which led him to be the man he obviously became. What uh, what about the other parts? Yeah. Of the book? So, and if I could just say about that first part, I'm really it, it was in some ways the hardest part of the book to write because, uh, as much as I said, the the personal papers are rich. Um, the first time we hear Ross's voice in the historical record is when he's on a troop ship sailing out of Albany in 1914 and he's 22 years old so for the first 22 years of his life we we don't have anything surviving that he wrote um and given that his name surname was smith it even made using the newspapers quite problematic and the genealogical records so um i really had to work hard to to reconstruct his childhood and i'm really really pleased with the result of it i think um you know i i think that it, it it, it helps to capture a sense of who he was, and quite often I've had to use circumstantial evidence and and um, and you know at times as a historian and and I think all historians do this um, I've had to speculate although I've been clear to the reader when that's happening and when I'm moving away from evidence into speculation. Um, but yeah, that, that those first four chapters 
do sum up his his um, his early life and sort of set the stage. The second um, part of the book deals with his time from enlistment in August 1914 until the time that he joins um, the Australian Flying Corps in late 1916. So that's really his time with the um, the Third Australian Light Horse Regiment, um, initially at Gallipoli, but then also at the Sinai and. Um, it's a really interesting time for Ross because of his cadet experience. He's rapidly promoted. Um, he enlists as a private. He's promptly appointed as a sergeant, skipping over the rank of corporal um, on the way. And through that experience, we, we learn something interesting about the AIF and, and the difficulties that Australian authorities had in raising a force in 1914. Um, here we have Ross Smith, a 22-year-old. He'd been a warehouseman in, um, in, a, in a department store before the war. He had a little bit of cadet experience. And here he is um, in charge of uh, a, a lot of men who are older than him. Uh, far more worldly than him, and some of them are not inclined to do what they're told. And so it's a real sort of trial by fire for him, those initial months of training in Egypt, um, of trying to learn how to manage men. And it's it's a difficult phase for him. He writes quite candidly about it to his mother. Um, and then the sequel to that is his his initial experience of combat at Gallipoli, which is is everything that we know it to have been. It's shocking, it's traumatic. Although I must say he he um, uncharacteristically downplays a lot of that in the letters to his mother. Um, and to fill that gap in, I actually went and used the letters and diaries of a lot of um, other men in his unit to try and fill in um, his experiences because he wasn't yeah, telling his mum the truth about what that was like. And what about um, the, the pivotal moment where he leaves the the light horse and joins the Australian Flying Corps? He was evacuated um, sick from Gallipoli in late 1916 with a fever that actually nearly killed him. Um, and he spends a few months in early 1916 in, uh, in England convalescing. And then he's sent back to um, his unit, in the, then posted to the Sinai um, in 1916 to fight the Turks. And he's, it, it's, it's quite remarkable, Matt, because he's, he's absolutely itching to get back into the action, um, he, even after Gallipoli. Um, he wants to get back to his unit. He wants to fight. He's recently been commissioned as a lieutenant, so he's very keen to... Um, you know, to, to serve in that new capacity in the unit. And I think he's with the unit for about three days when he decides that um, serving on long range desert patrols is not for him. <laughs> um, and he becomes bored and it's a real part of his personality. He tends to become bored with things very quickly. Um, he's always on the lookout for, for the next thing. The thing that keeps him in the desert for some months, however, is that he's put in charge of a machine gun section and he becomes quite obsessive about machine guns and he really, be, um, he really enjoys using them and he learns everything about them. Um, he fights at the Battle of Romani in August 1916, probably the most important battle in the Sinai campaign and one of the m more important battles in the Middle East. Um, but yeah, then becomes bored again. And, and that's when he hears that there's a call for volunteers for the Australian Flying Corps. And um, he essentially talks his way into the job because because it was very, very competitive. Obviously, a lot of other light horsemen also wanted to get out of the desert um, and into what they perceived as a more comfortable job um, in a flying unit. Um, but he talked his way into it. He was accepted. And um, yeah, he excels very quickly as an aerial observer. One of the things that strikes me when you describe that journey, Michael, is that um, several months ago, I interviewed Charlie Duke, one of the Apollo astronauts who landed on the moon. And just it's, it's incredible the parallels that exist throughout the eras because Charlie Duke was a fighter pilot during the Cold War and was in pretty much the same boat, that he was excelling as a fighter pilot and a test pilot. And he was just looking for the next thing. And then he heard NASA were looking for astronauts to, to join the Apollo program. So he signed up and was, was eventually uh, accepted for that program. It's extraordinary how these high achievers are always looking for the next big adventure, isn't it? And it's almost like, and I've seen it in other airmen, um, as I said before, I've written about Charles Ulm and Charles Kingsford Smith. Um, and from the reading I've done about other early aviators, Lindbergh is another good example. These men, I describe it as a disease, um, you know, um, where they just are... Com you know, constantly, constantly being compelled to search for. And it's it's what makes them great, 
but in some cases it's also um, a, it becomes a character flaw or a personality flaw and in, in some cases it leads them to to their doom um, but Ross is interesting as well Matt because he's again the richness of the letters shows us his thought processes as he's applying to transfer into the flying corps. Um, and here he is in late 1916 writing to his mother that he thinks that after the war, aviation is going to be, he uses the expression, the coming thing. Um, and he can see that in 1916, as a result of the role that aircraft are playing in the war, and I must say that at that point in the Middle East, they were playing a fairly limited role, but he could see at that point that they were going to be a, a big deal after the, after the war finished. And he was thinking at that time already about, well, he didn't want to go back to working in a department store. He wanted he wanted a, a career in aviation, and he saw this as his ticket to doing that. Well, he had a distinguished career in the uh, in the Australian Flying Corps during the First World War, and as you said, it was was awarded many bravery medals and, and came home a, a celebrated man. But that's not what we remember him for, is it? We remember him for 1919 and this epic journey from England to Australia. And I mean, that's that's probably the reason the book exists. That's the, the reason we remember him. So why don't you tell us about this incredible journey that he undertook from England to Australia in 1919? There's actually a little bit of a, a sort of a, a, a precursor to this that I think is important to understand. And, and I think before I did the research on this book, I, I didn't realise how important this was. And that is that when the war in the Middle East ended um, in 1918, um, Ross had become quite well known to a couple of British generals in the Middle East, um, RAF generals. And um, he had also been entrusted with flying the RAF's only heavy bomber in the Middle East, the Handley Page 0400, huge aircraft, um, t twin engine, uh, biplane uh, with a crew of four or five uh, men. And um, the, these two generals were interested in surveying a aerial route from Cairo in Egypt to Calcutta in India, essentially to link the British Empire by air. Again, perceiving that this is going that aviation is going to be a very important thing um, in the in the post-war years, and they select Ross to be part of that expedition. So Ross is involved in the first ever flight from Cairo to Calcutta um, at the end of 1918. And one of the generals and him then get the idea that they might uh, continue and they might survey an aerial route to Australia. Now, they can't do that by air because in 1919, there are no prepared airfields between Calcutta and effectively Melbourne. Um, in Australia, there is just nowhere for aircraft prepared for aircraft to land, and so they charter a, a ship, um, a small a small ship, a small Indian naval ship, and they actually um, an expedition all through Southeast Asia, including up into Thailand, and then down into as far as um, as far as Timor, surveying um, and mapping possible locations that um, an aircraft might land, and their plan during this time is that they're going to go back to India and they're going to fly their Handley Page uh, twin-engine bomber, then using these improvised um, airfields they've surveyed, all the way to Australia. Um, and this is in 1919. And the fascinating thing is that this is completely... Um, completely independent of the competition that the Australian government is also planning at the time. And we talk about accidents of history, and certainly there were a number of them in Ross Smith's life, um, including you know some very narrow escapes from death. But when they returned to India after this survey journey, ready to fly to Australia in the middle of 1919, they find that the Handley Page has been destroyed in a violent storm. And there's no other heavy air, um, long-range aircraft in India for them to fly. So at that point, they've got to return to England. And that's when Ross learns about this competition the Australian government has uh, announced to, for the, essentially to award £10,000 for the first Australian crew to fly from England to Australia. And it's at that point that Ross decides to enter the race himself with, with his brother Keith. And so tell us about that journey because it really is one of the great stories of adventure and near misses and just damned perseverance that uh, that I've ever come across. I mean, the whole thing is is extraordinary. I mean, Billy Hughes um, announces the ten thousand pound prize without consulting the government. There's some accounts we don't know um, how how accurate they are, but there's some secondhand accounts that he'd essentially met some um, airmen who were recovering in hospital, some Australian airmen who told him they wanted to fly home, and that's where he got the idea. Um, but however it panned out, um, eight crews ended up entering the race. Um, of the eight, only Ross and Keith and their crew, which 
consisted of two other Australian mechanics, um, Wally Shires and, and Jim Bennett. They would be the only ones to complete the race within the 30-day time limit that the Australian government had set. Only one other crew made it to Australia at all, and they did so after 200-and-something days. So um, that in itself, I think, illustrates just how implausible um, this this challenge that the Australian government had set. And I think, quite frankly, the competition in itself um, indicates the ignorance of um, those in the Australian government, and particularly Prime Minister Hughes, of just how um, difficult this journey would be to do in 1919. The big problem wasn't so much the aircraft. There were aircraft like the Handley Page, which I've already mentioned, um, and the Vickers Vimy, which Ross um, Smith and his crew flew, that did have quite long ranges. Um, earlier in 1919, um, Alcock and Brown had flown across the Atlantic, for example. So long range flying was possible. But as I mentioned before, the really, really big challenge with, um, with this flight was that uh, between Britain and Cairo in Egypt, there was some infrastructure. The RAF had some airfields and there was uh, certainly, you know, supplies of fuel and oil and facilities to overhaul aircraft. Between Cairo and Calcutta, there were sparsely spread RAF st stations um, and very limited resources. And then beyond Calcutta, there was nothing. And um, pretty much beyond that, they either had to use improvised landing grounds, such as race courses. Um, they landed on the race course in Singapore, for example, or they had to rely on sections of the jungle that had been cleared by the Dutch East Indies government. So, And then the problems didn't stop once they made it to Australia. Um, they land in Darwin um, after 28 days, so just inside the 30 days uh, time limit. And then it's an epic journey um, that takes them, in fact, nearly three months to fly across Australia. In, in some ways, that part of the journey was the most difficult. Again, because there's just no airfields in northern Australia, a few very rudimentary ones had had been established, um, but also because by that time, not only was the crew exhausted, but the aircraft was uh, was on its last legs as well. Well, you're certainly right when you say the challenges of this journey, because several of the crews that attempted it were killed in, in the attempt, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, there were a few of the crews that were killed. Um, and look, just the amount of, the number of times in the book, and as, as people are reading it, I think they're going to get the sense that... Um, you know, there's so many near misses, um, you know, so many instances during the journey when it just seemed like it was all over. Um, you know, a couple that spring to mind, uh, I think probably the worst moment in the whole journey occurred in um, Siam, what we now call Thailand, um, where uh, Ross was told by the local um, Thai aviation uh, core that there was a brand new airfield that they had built um, halfway between Bangkok and Singapore, um, that it was stocked with uh, with uh, 500 gallons of fuel, which was uh, enough for him to then get the rest of the way to Singapore, um, and that it would basically cut what would have been one of the longest journeys in half. Um, he flew down there in um, almost typhoon conditions. I mean, he was flying at the start of the journey through a European winter and the end of a journey through a tropical wet season. So it was it was really the worst time of year. But he flew to um, to this new airfield at a place called Singora, and when they landed or when they arrived over the airfield, Ross and Keith looked down and they saw that not only was the airfield waterlogged, but it was covered in tree stumps. So the trees had been cut down, but the stumps hadn't been cleared. Um, lacking fuel, though, to go any further, um, he had to land. And miraculously, the aircraft more or less missed most of the stumps and was only sustained minor damage. But at that point, of course, became, um, became bogged in the mud. Um, Ross went to the local authorities, the local Thai authorities, managed to convince them to lend him 200 convict labourers who came out in leg irons and helped, spent the next two days helping him remove tree stumps and get the aircraft unbogged. Um, and then they took off again. I mean, you know, that sort of thing happens time and time again throughout the flight. And there's just so many instances, um, particularly Keith, who kept a diary throughout the flight, so many instances in which Keith essentially says, this is it, everything's over, we're finished. Um, and something, you know, something steps in. And I wouldn't go as far as saying it was all luck. Um, they were incredibly resourceful. The two mechanics, and as Ross 
himself pointed out after the flight, the two mechanics were extraordinary and did almost superhuman things to get that aircraft or keep that aircraft flying in these incredibly primitive conditions across Southeast Asia. It's just an extraordinary journey and I'd encourage everyone to go out and grab the book to read all the details of it because you won't believe just some of the things they got up to. And I'd also say to people, when you go to Adelaide, the next time you're in Adelaide, go to Adelaide Airport and go and see the plane, which is there discreetly at the edge of the car park. Most people don't even know it's there, but it's extraordinary that that's the original plane that first first flew from from England to Australia. But what tell us about the the later stages of of uh, Ross Smith's life and his uh, his yeah. So end. as I mentioned before, he was afflicted by this this disease, pioneer aviator disease, perhaps we might call it, um, where. Uh, very soon after after completing this feat and getting the ten thousand dollars, which uh, ten thousand pounds, sorry, which he split between his his crew members, um, he's almost immediately thinking about the next challenge. And at that time, Ross Smith was the most famous airman in the world. He was certainly the most famous Australian in the world. Um, he struggled with fame, and I think um, I've managed in the book to to explore that a bit. Um, just how, I mean, he was a very the, the, par- the paradox of Ross Smith is that while on the one hand he was always pushing the boundaries and and um, and and always looking for new challenges and putting himself out there, he was also a really really modest um, modest guy and he really didn't didn't like the attention and so he struggled with the fame, but he then hatched a plan having flown halfway around the world from England to Australia to actually circumnavigate the globe by air. Um, it took he and Keith and, and one of the, the two mechanics that they'd, they'd employed to go on this flight with them, uh, Jim Bennett. It took them two years essentially to prepare for this flight. Um, and part of that two years or a lot of that time was spent organizing, again, not so much the aircraft, but the landing places en route. They needed to organize landing places across northern Asia, uh, Japan, um, Alaska, Across North America, places in some instances where aircraft had never even flown, um, let alone fl- flown as as part of their journey a- around the entire globe. Um, the the key to the flight, however, was going to be a new aircraft that Vickers had produced called the Vickers Viking, and um, it was a it was a, it was a seaplane. And if you look at photographs of it, and there's some pictures in the book, um, it looks like a boat with a pair of biplane wings attached to it. Um, it's a very odd-looking aircraft, um, and it was a very difficult aircraft to fly. It was heavy, um, it stalled um, very easily, and it was quite temperamental on the controls. In other words, it was qu- it was entirely different to the Vickers Vimy, which Ross himself had wrote, written uh, was was a joy to fly and was very very forgiving. Um, compounding this was the fact that in those two years between the um, flight to Australia and the attempt to fly around the world, Ross did very little flying himself. Um, Most of that time he was engaged in uh, lecturing to a film that had been made about his England to Australia flight um, and essentially doing the office work to, to plan for the next flight. So he was out of practice as well. And um, tragically, on um, in April 1922, he was testing the the Vickers Viking um, at Brooklyn's Aerodrome, just outside of um, just outside of London. Where, um, interestingly and coincidentally, maybe even ironically, he had first seen an aeroplane fly back in 1910 as a as a cadet when he'd been on the cadet tour. Um, but he was testing the aircraft there that morning. Um, and he took it up on a test flight and uh, he stalled the aircraft and it crashed and he and Jim Bennett were killed. Keith wasn't on board that morning. He was supposed to be, but he was running late um, coming from London and, and, and had he not been, chances are he would have died as well. Just an extraordinary story all round. And, uh, you know, he, he jammed a lot into a, a very short span of life. All these years later, what is the legacy of Ross Smith? Why is it important that we remember him and his brother Keith and, and their great achievements at the start of the century? Yeah, look, before before Ross Smith's uh, arrival in Australia in late 1919 at the end of the race, um, there were aircraft in Australia. There were a handful of, of aeroplanes um, that the Defence Department had at their, uh, at their flying school at Point Cook and there was another flying school at Richmond. Um, and, you know, there'd been uh, overseas visitors, um, aviators come through and tour around Australian cities with aircraft. By and large, however, even in 1919, aviation was a remote thing, a remote phenomenon for Australians. You know, it was something that was was happening in Europe and it was something that was happening in North America. Ross Smith's flight across the world demonstrated to the world that 
intercontinental air travel was, if not yet possible, it was going to be possible in the future. What he demonstrated to Australia, however, was that aviation had a role here. And I really think he brought the air age to Australia. Um, for many Australians, and we, his tour through Australia uh, with the Vimy after the, after the great flight from England, drew hundreds of thousands of people to come and see him and his brother and the aeroplane. Uh, and then after the flight, um, he he drew hundreds of thousands of people in Australia and Britain to see his lecture and the film that was made of it. So um, we historians of the air talk about air mindedness, this sort of this, this, this attitude, this outlook um, that develops among people and communities that sees aviation as an important and viable thing for the future. And I really think that Ross Smith played a major role in, in bringing the air age and bringing air mindedness to Australia in, in 1919. Well, Michael, the book is a, an absolutely wonderful achievement. It's called Anzac and Aviator, and it's out now by Michael Malkentine. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show, mate, to talk all about it. Thank you very much for, um, for having me on and for reading the book. Mm-hmm.